The recording has commenced. Uh, Charmaine, um, I'm going to hand over to Roger, and he will introduce and invite you to pray. So over to you, Roger. Thank you. Charmaine, would you like to um, open our meeting in prayer tonight? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Heavenly Father, it's so good to be in your presence with these wonderful Christian souls, Lord, all eager to learn more and to pray more about bringing souls into your kingdom. Mm. We ask you, Lord, to um, bless this meeting, bless everybody on it, and uh, even those who are not on it for various reasons. We ask you to bless the whole of Australia for Jesus. Mm. And we ask, Lord, for special blessings on Tony and Roger and Lorraine and anyone else who's going to be leading tonight. And we just commit the whole thing to your name, Lord, and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, um, uh, before I bring up the, the, the presentation as such, I might ask Charles to, 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 let, to let us know how he's feeling, how things are going. And I, I did introduce uh, or mention that Carrie Ann from Tamworth is with us. Carrie Ann's a real soldier for the Lord up there. I met her on a number of occasions at the Tamworth Country Music Festival. And Pam Blunt, of course, is um, an active prayer warrior in in Toowoomba. So we've got Tamworth and Toowoomba well represented tonight. I noticed one of Muriel Van Twist's uh, uh, reports in the campaign report. I was excited to see that, Muriel. And uh, I've just been mapping out, just in case you're wondering about these campaign reports that come in, I write them all out. So you're very much what you call a slavish reference to the manual. I'm not one of these wizards that can sort of flick things onto a spreadsheet, you know, an Excel spreadsheet very quickly. And um, But it helps me to sort of meditate on and thank God for all of the effort of all the saints. And that, that's only one sheet. I've got them here. And I don't normally show off my homework like this, but I'm just showing it off today because I, I talked to uh, Lorraine. And these are just all the reports for August that um, I was backtracking on, plus a little bit of a spillover into September. And... Uh, <clears throat> I gave this comprehensive report to Lorraine, which miracle of miracles, she was happy to agree with because she's a real stickler for absolute accuracy. So I'm glad we had a meeting of the minds at a mutually profitable point. So over to you, Charles. Okay. Well, God is good. Yeah. Amen. I've been um, learning to praise the Lord in all circumstances and um, really quite looking forward to understanding all that he has in store for me during this um, trial, let's put it that way. Um, you know, I know he is going to heal me and I have no doubt in that, that he is my healer. But at the moment, the symptoms don't quite align to that. And in fact, um, the balance and the strength in my arms are getting worse and the fingers as well. But, um, you know, that doesn't limit God, you know. In fact, the the, um, the worse the symptoms, the greater the glory for his healing. And so I am not worried by these symptoms. They don't define me, but God does. So Amen. I think that's a reasonable update, Tony. Well, well indeed it is. And we, we want to offer a prayer on your behalf. Uh, Charles, well, we just conned that. So I might call upon Pam Blunt to pray for uh, pray for Charles' complete recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bible says that uh, we are to give the Lord no rest. Yep. And uh, I'm sure Pam, being an intercessor, will join me in that sentiment as we as we approach the throne of grace for help in time of need. Thank you, Pam. You might need to un. un Unmute there, Pam. Thank you. 
We come before you, mighty God, and we stand shoulder to shoulder in agreement. We decree and declare in the name of our advocate, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that Charles is healed in your name and by the Amen. power, the dunamis power of your Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. He is healed. Disease cannot stay in his body. It must go. It is not from you, the true and living God. Mm. It, it So therefore it has no place in this son of the God most high. It must leave Charles' body, uh, Charles' body to be restored completely the way it was created to be by our heavenly father. His body restored in every uh, every perfection of uh, how it was created. Mm -hmm. Every cell in his body Amen. will be clean and uh, pure and just as it is meant to be. It will function. His whole body will function. Amen, amen and amen. Praise Thank you. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Tony, do you mind if I just say one last thing? And that is Absolutely. that the Lord gave me just a some wonderful, I'm not sure whether they're dreams or visions, because at one point they were a dream, but I think it morphed into a vision later, about um, basically returning to work, which I wasn't necessarily planning to do, but um, returning to work and jumping for joy, clicking my heels, knowing that I'd been healed. And when I got into work, I prayed for all these sick people, the colleagues of mine that I know, and saw them healed, delivered of demons, uh, coming into a relationship with God the Father, and truly a wonderful experience, you know. And so that was part of it. But the other part was that God showed me that there was various weapons of the enemy still in my body that need to be removed. And so um, I won't go into all of it and all the detail, but, yeah, so maybe you can pray that these weapons get removed from my body. I oh, think perhaps yeah. Pam just did, Charles. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't quite finished, but um, uh, the Lord didn't show me those things, but uh, let me continue on as, as he does. I'll seek him yeah. to show me what it is, in, yep. and we'll be, I'll be very specific about that. Yep. Mm. Good. So can we proceed? Yes, yeah, yeah. With yeah. the meeting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, with the meeting, very good. So our, our theme for some weeks, which will flash up on the screen, is that of being an overcomer. And perhaps we can read this together. It doesn't matter if you're on mute. You don't have to unmute for it. But just uh, sort of vocalise it as we go through it. Let's read it together. And they overcame him, overcame him by the blood of the Lord. And by the word of their testimony. By the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives. They loved not their lives unto their death. Unto their death. Revelation 12, 11. So <clears throat> that's our continuing theme. Uh, and we we feel, not only myself, but many others, that we're in the, the uh, beginning of the end days, uh, that we've got to run up for seven to ten years, probably only about seven years to go before the coming of the Lord. We're not picking the day nor the hour, but it certainly seems like a, a sequence has been unleashed. And um, we'll look into this scripture a little bit later, but I'll ask Roger to read it for us. Thanks, Roger. For well, this is how we love God, <clears throat> that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 5, verses 3 to 5. Excellent. And we'll come back to this in a little while. Okay, so um, characteristically, we like to look at our statistics and uh, see where they're taking us. And I'd like Lorraine to comment on and uh, what we've got up there on the screen. Yes, certainly, Tony. Um, Tony, you're, you're the 
my image is on your name at the moment. Um, I shouldn't worry about no. that, Lorraine. It your makes profile, me my profile's on your, yeah, okay. Okay, so look at it. It's it's looking wonderful. Um, 120 to 31st of August. Isn't that wonderful? It's 120 Absolutely. campaigns. Um, we had 102 um, to the 31st of July. My figures came to 96, but Tony's sent me some updates. Um, and 23 to the 8th of September. 4,618 campaigns. Is that still correct, Tony? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So we've only got 315 campaigns to meet our goal of 1,200 campaigns for the year. And we've still got the rest of September, October, November and December. So glory to God, we are going to make it. Thank you, Jesus. So, 7,573 response prayers. Perfect. Okay, so that what that means is if you take the response prayers that are listed there, uh, the <clears throat> the um, I was coming across a uh, there was a brother I, I was talking to just very recently, in fact, over the weekend, and he was um, he was wondering about you know, the, the the quality of these response prayers, basically. And uh, I said a response prayer indicates that there's a heart that's desirous of a relationship with God, and it may may be a step uh, towards that. It may crystallize into a, you know, a conversion straight away, or it may take some time, but God will never forget that, that prayer, that cry from the heart of the individual. And I've seen that uh, very often we want instantaneous results, whereas it may take some time to unfold. For example, uh, Larry, who is Maria's husband, happened to be doing some flooring work in a home over on the North Shore of Sydney after the, there'd been, a, I think, an internal flood from heavy rain. And uh, he uh, showed the way of life to the lady of the house who came to the Lord and then left me with her name, and uh, I arranged for her to come to Life Source Christian Church, which she did. And Mary Louise continued to, over a period of some, quite some time, maintain a relationship and support, and uh, <clears throat> pray with her and meet with her. She was going through a, 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 a breakdown in relationship. And she wasn't managing her two sons all that well. And anyway, she was subsequently baptized. And um, uh, now Mary Louise is helping her become connected with the ladies in the church. And, um, you know, she is starting to take on some of the, the baby steps of a person who is moving conscientiously towards God. You see, so uh, very often we, we, we don't realize what great steps the Lord has taken us through and how long it took us to sort of get on board. So every step forward is a step in the right direction. I think you'll agree. Um, I don't know okay. if you've ever, uh, Someone wanted to make a comment there? Yeah, me. I said, amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, so um, if a person is, we don't we don't manipulate people into praying the sinner's prayer. We don't force them to, we don't intimidate them. Uh, if they want to pray the sinner's prayer, God's going to hear it. And uh, I remember Steve Prager said to me that the first time he prayed the sinner's prayer was just to appease the guy who um, showed him the gospel. And then subsequently he ended up in church and I happened to be preaching and he came forward trembling under the power of the Holy Spirit. So... You know, things will happen. Now, to, just to continue uh, with the with the presentation, I'm just going to get this slide to fill in some of the things that Lorraine, as the chief, the deputy chief executive officer, has outlined as strong priorities for us. Lorraine, do you want to just read those for us? Yes, yeah, sure. Our vision for the next five years from 2024 to 2029 is to have 10,000 registered soul winners, active would be great, overcoming the saints, overcoming saints, being, becoming overcoming saints, multitudes swept into God's kingdom, a return to righteousness across the nations, especially Australia, 
families saved and don't we want our loved ones and our prodigals brought mm -hmm. home. A strength in the times of trial because there's going to be more trials coming up that we need to be strong and, and ready for and have the full armour of God on for those and standing ready for the coming of the Lord. As one body, as one body, standing ready for the coming of the Lord. And, Tony, I just love that this AFJ is really a family that goes out and shares the gospel just like the church in the, in the very beginning and we come back and we're we're a family together and I think that's what the church is meant to be like. So um, I just um I just praise God and thank him for Australia for Jesus. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And um just to underscore the I'm just welcoming Wint Linda Harvey uh to the meeting tonight. Praise God. Uh, just a little extract there. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 21, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. You know how people are fond of using the word great? Oh, it was a great picnic. It was a great barbecue. It was a great church service. Well, when, when the Bible uses the word great, it goes far, 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 far beyond our notion of the word great. It's just an overwhelming mm -hmm. cataclysmic type of event. So when he comes, it's with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. And he spoke to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you uh, you know, you see and know of your own selves that summer is near at hand. So likewise, ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Early I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. Surfeiting is not surfing. Surfeiting is excesses of life and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that they comes upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, and this is the point we're leading up to. This is Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What a great day that will be, Lorraine. What a great time that will be. Amen. Let's watch ye therefore and pray that we may be counted worthy so there is a sense in which there is a being counted worthy. Now let's let's move on to some startling statistics that Lorraine shared with me today. Now Lorraine, you might like to go through these. I was really really taken aback by the extent of them myself. Just uh, go through. Uh, yes, well, I've been um, merging three databases um, over the last three or four weeks, and the last week I've been sick with the flu, and so I've been in bed with my phone. Um, and putting every person um, that's on the database into their respective groups. And so we now have the totals that are in each place, Queensland having 1,513 people, New South Wales 2,224, ACT 301 people, um, Victoria 1,625, Tasmania 139, which is a wonderful that we've got 139 people registered in Tasmania and we haven't Indeed. even got a team there yet. Um, 1,477 in WA, 506 in South Australia, 43 in Northern Territory, also a place where we don't have a team. And New Zealand, UK, UK and others uh, 1167 with a total of 7,936 registered soul winners um, on our database. Now, so, I should say, praise God. Uh, Lorraine, before we get too excited about New Zealand, UK, and other, it should be one. Yeah, that should be 167. Yeah, I'll fix that. Yeah. But uh, it's still near, it's getting it's just, just shy there. of 8,000. Mm. A shy of 8,000. Yeah. So there's 10 so, in New Zealand and 10 in the UK. So we might right. need to let Christopher Teasdale know about those 10 yes. and um, and also get something going in New Zealand. Very good. Yes, yes. 
but certainly plenty of opportunity there. Now, normally I have a complete lineup. There's there's our screen on Charles. We've actually heard from Charles, um, and the the simple notion is let us uphold him continually. We thank God for hearing Pam's prayer earlier, and and these are these are old photographs, and that's because I've just been through, but I'm just running through them just quickly to let people know that there's been plenty of activity in quite a variety of places, and I could have just put up a whole fresh battery of of photographs um, from um, other events uh, but um, that have taken place in the meantime. But uh, we, I just didn't get time to do it today, so please forgive me on that. So we now come to the, the theme for this evening, the theme of this is how we love God, that we keep his commandments and uh, the overcoming life. What we, what we want to do is talk, and I'll just stop the share at this stage, what we want to do is just talk about the overcoming life in action. Prior to this, we've had preparing for the overcoming life and becoming an overcomer. Now we want to look at what does it look like in action. As an opening story, some years ago, I was the person responsible for the conduct of the Alpha course in the in the business setting throughout Australia, and uh, with the help of the the Alpha International team, uh, I would um, be invited to go to uh, I'd be invited to go to Holy Trinity Brompton in London every second year to the Alpha International Conference. It was a glorious, glorious time in the Lord and. Uh, I was just so grateful for the many experiences that I had, even meeting people who had been mentioned in Nicky Gumbel's book, uh, which dealt with changed lives. I think that um, uh, a fellow called Alston Drew put together four whole books of totally changed lives that have been affected by the Holy Spirit through the Alpha Course, and wonderful to to read. It was one lady that um, was involved with the the MGM film group and she was given to, what do you call it, when a person likes a sip of alcohol every five minutes or so, a dipsomaniac, would you say that? And she was very much involved with her husband in parties and all sorts of things. And, um, <clears throat> and her, her name was uh, Deirdre and uh, uh, interestingly, uh, she was at home in absolute desperation on one occasion. She had a, a child upstairs. She'd come downstairs, and uh, suddenly she had a visitation of angels. This was during the fact during the time she was attending the Alpha Course and started seeking the Lord. And uh, she was absolutely spellbound for a number of hours in God's presence. Now, you could probably wonder what what was happening to the babies upstairs. Uh, as she was suddenly in God's presence for this extended period of time, well, the babies were quiet and suffered no ill, Ill nothing ill, were completely looked after, and she was wonderfully transformed. And it was my pleasure to meet people like her who had been written about in some of Nikki Gumbel's um, uh, books or the things that came out as a result of uh, the work in Holy Trinity. So uh, one, one year I was over there... Uh, I was talking to Sandy Miller, who was the rector of Holy Trinity. And uh, one day I, I said, I'm going to visit Scotland. But before that, I took a weekend trip up to Oxford and I had a particular thing in mind to do. I was going to visit the place where uh, two of the great reformers in 1552 had been burned at the stake. That was... Uh, John uh, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer. Is anyone on the group tonight, if you want to put up a hand? Uh, Honey, of... could you fix your camera, please? Because we can't see you. Oh, oh well, now we can. Yeah. You fixed it. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I thought it was better without me, but there you go. The, <laughs> so, but anyone, anyone on our meeting tonight heard of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. Uh, Heather has. Pam Blunt has. 
Anybody else that I missed? Oh, I think Kerry Ann has. Good. I'm amongst an informed group tonight. Oh, I see that Roisin's got her hand up. So I went to the very spot where Ridley and Latimer had been burned at the stake. It was a small bronze disc affixed to the road. And it was interesting that it was a nice day in Oxford. But it was interesting that people were traipsing and cycling and uh, walking backwards and forwards in that space next to the building and uh, completely oblivious of the fact that this momentous event had taken place in that very spot in 1552 during the reign of Mary Tudor, the daughter of Henry VIII, who came to power after her brother Edward had died. And uh, so uh, that was the uh, re a resurgence of Catholicism. And she, being a bit, very bigoted Catholic, had asserted herself and began under Bishop Loud, L-A-U-D, of London, st started to introduce terrible persecutions. And Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, details all of the all of the martyrdoms or some of the key martyrdoms that took place during that time of the Protestants that were hauled out and burned at the stake uh, for their upholding the gospel of the Lord. The crime of Nicholas and Hugh being both bishops under the previous king, Edward the Seventh, uh, no, sorry, Edward Edward the Sixth, uh, was that they were reformers, and that they would not confess to the fact that that the doctrine of transubstantiation, which the Catholic Church still upholds, that the bread and the wine becomes the actual body of blood during the sacrifice of the Mass. I mean, if you go back to the Scriptures, you'll discover there's no such thing as the sacrifice of the Mass. And throughout the book of Hebrews, if it says it once, it seems to say it many, many times, that there was one sufficient, complete sacrifice only, and that was in the person of Jesus, who literally died on a literal cross and shed his literal blood once for all. And the Catholic Mass starts to repeat that. So their crime under Mary's governments was that they would not admit to the transubstantiation doctrine. And for this reason, they were assigned to be burned at the stake as heretics. So here they are in the Tower of London, ready to be marched off to be uh, put to, to death in this grisly way. And so they, they strapped them to or tied them to uh, to the stakes, put the faggots. The faggots are uh, large bundles of sticks or, and very, very dry sticks that will burn fiercely uh, around their feet. And the fires lit, the crowd looks on. There's always a crowd at these events. They didn't have television in those days, and this was certainly something momentous for people to see. And uh, some people looked on in glee, some people were crying, some people were just stunned to see the, the brutality of the government at the time. And uh, Hugh Latimer, uh, in the torture of his uh, affliction, cried out to uh, Nicholas Ridley these famous words. He says, be of good cheer, Mr. Ridley, and play the man, for today we light a candle for the gospel that in all of England will never be put out. Will never be put out. Will never be put out. So uh, what we are saying here is that these men loved not their lives even under the point of death, and I, I, I think I was moved to tears when I was there. But I noticed that the indifferent crowd moving backwards and forwards, people on bicycles whizzing past, people traipsing along looking at the shops and so forth, are completely oblivious to the momentous thing that God had shone his light on on this occasion. And I have to say I reflected on the thought, what if I was in that position? 
Would I be of good cheer? Would I play the man? Would I love my life, not love my life, un even unto the point of death, as they did? And I take comfort for the fact that the Lord of glory does not expect us to be overcomers in our own strength because he is the one that strengthens us. You remember, of course, his conversation with Peter, who had said things to the effect that uh, he would never let the Lord down. And Peter was called a rock, which indicates a person who is steadfast. But Jesus uh, deferred deferred um, to an earlier title for Peter. He left temporarily calling him Peter and said to him, Simon, Simon. Isn't that interesting that Jesus regressed to Peter's old name when he addressed him because he was addressing a man of the flesh. Simon, Simon. You know, he was saying, Satan has asked that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. There's great strength in a, for us to know, great strength for us to know that Jesus even now has prayed for us and is praying for us and will pray for us. And Peter was good right up to the point of his departure. He even refers to it in 2 Peter, the time of my departure is at hand. So he certainly recovered under the strength of Jesus. So we, we leave the thoughts of Ridley and Latimer and Peter's recovery to, to remind ourselves that tonight the the only qualification for the end time saint to enter into the promises of God is to be an overcomer. Isn't that exciting? That's the only qualification you need to be, be an overcomer. And seven times he says to the seven churches, if you heard me say, to him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he'll go no more out, he'll stand in the temple of my God. And that's, uh, I believe, the, the promise he gives to the um, to the Church of Philadelphia. Now, I'm holding up here a copy of The Pilgrim's Progress, a very popular edition. It's a beautifully written book. In one of my visits to the UK, another priority I had was to visit the home, well, not the home, but the church that was set up the meeting house for John Bunyan. And Charmaine and I have shared many a great thought about the pilgrim, what it is to be a pilgrim and so forth. And many of you realise that, of course, the pilgrim did go, um, Christian as his name was, to a house called the House of the Interpreter. And he was led in and, and he was shown various pictures uh, by the interpreter to help him understand that the, what the journey of the Christian life would be like. And in having these conversations with the, the interpreter, he's given a picture of a man who is dressed in armour and he fronts up, there's a, there's a castle and there are people on the wall of a castle and they're like the children of light. And there's a doorway and a drawbridge to get over the castle. But there are many mighty men of um, strength fit to oppose anyone who would enter into it. Not far from the doorway, probably a couple of hundred metres, there's a table and there's a man sitting there with a list and an inkhorn. And... Uh, People are supposed to go up there, put down their name, and then they will battle to get into the castle. And uh, this is the only parable, shall we say, in the interpreter's house in the Pilgrim's Progress where no explanation is needed. So the man who's dressed in armour comes up to the guy with the ink horn and says to him, write my name down. 
and he takes up his sword and he starts to fall upon these villains that are trying to stop him from going through the door and he, he suffers many wounds and he gives out probably as much as he, he gets and he battles and struggles and thrusts and there's a violence that ensues mightily reminiscent of the scripture which says the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and those that are violent enter therein. And finally he gets to the door and the gate opens and then the people dressed in white and glory on the battlements of the castle sing out, come in, come in, eternal glory thou shalt win. And at that point, Christian turns to the interpreter and says, I, I know what this means. He doesn't need the interpreter to tell him. Now, I'm going to ask you, what do you think it means? I know Charmaine and I have discussed this, and I might even ask Charmaine if she feels up to it, to either sing or recite that little poem that we have shared in the past, if she can find it, to be a pilgrim. But you're, you're, you're at this moment, of course, on mute, Charmaine. We can um, now see, yes. can now see your computer. It's a good picture of you. He who would true valor see, let him come hither. That's right. Um, good. Yes. I I probably have to go and find it because my brain's not very good. Well, we'll let you do that. Better. We'll let you do that. Who would true yes. valor see, let him come <laughs> hither. Okay, well, we'll let you hunt that up because that is a great little theme for us to, to begin our talk tonight. Um I saw a sign in the Greek, which I immediately recognized because I did, I did study New Testament Greek, and it said, Jesus Christos Nikta, which means Jesus Christ, the victor. Jesus is victor. Jesus is the winner. Jesus has the victory. And that's the only thing we need to focus on in maintaining our purpose to be overcomers in the days which we find ourselves. So what sort of actions do we need to take to be effective in our overcoming? What, what things do we need to be aware of? Well, number one is we, if we're going to be an overcomer, that implies that we've got to be a valiant man or a valiant woman to defeat the enemy, sometimes in mortal battle. Uh, then we need to identify the enemy first and foremost. And there are three enemies that we have to deal with. Who knew that we had three enemies? Can I see your hand? Anyone who knew we had three enemies? Well, the flesh of the devil. Say that again. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And since the devil started all the nonsense, uh, we will focus on him first. And he's described in the... Uh, Book of Revelation is the devil, Satan, or that old serpent. That old serpent, taking that time back right to the beginning. And uh, so that's one of the one of the key enemies is the devil himself, right? And but then there are agents of the devil. There are direct agents, and there are indirect agents. And uh, the direct agents of the devil are evil spirits. And it seems to me that even though the people who die in the world have no opportunity to move around and be a nuisance to themselves if they are particularly wicked, they are wrapped up in hell awaiting the judgment, the evil spirits have quite some freedom of movement. And they're looking for bodies to occupy, and they're looking for worship and that's why you'll find just a plethora of different idols and gods all over India and all over Asia. There's all sorts of, um, whether it's animistic worship or what have you, or Buddhism, these are all facades set up by evil spirits to attract worship to themselves as well as the subservience of people. And they can actualize or obtain a sense of being by occupying people's bodies. Okay, that's not the only way they operate, of course, but it's one of the ways they seek to influence um, or, or benefit from the corporeal state of humans because they are themselves unable to manifest otherwise. Just as an aside, it is interesting to note 
that in the Catholic Church, there's there's a whole doctrine built around Mary. Who's aware of that? There's a whole doctrine in the Catholic mm-hmm. Church. Where, yeah. And um, sometimes people refer to it as Maryolatry, a form of uh, idolatry of Mary. Well, people may not realise it, but during the 1900s, that's the last century, there were over 400 recorded authenticated apparitions, that is, appearances, of a woman in the mystical world purporting to be Mary, the Queen of Heaven. She would take on various names. One of them was the Queen of Heaven. Another one was the Immaculate Conception and so forth. And sometimes there were sometimes there were interesting numbers associated with the appearances of these of these uh, ma- apparitions and great signs and wonders. Who's ever heard of the miracle of Fatima, where the sun spun like a disc in the sky? Well, Peter White has heard about it. Charles has heard about it. And Kerry Ann's heard about it. But it looks like we've just got here in time to tell the rest of you about it. But the sun in 1917, I think it was, or just before there when it took place, spun like a disc in the sky. It might have been a little bit later. Uh, and the people who had 50,000 people were gathered and saw this miracle taking place. And there'd been a rain shower uh, before this happened. And this sudden miracle of a sudden, all of their clothes were suddenly instantly dry. Amazing things have happened. You know, at, at Lourdes in France, there are miracles recorded, uh, orchestrated by Mary Immaculate. So the, the devil can ha- come in the form of uh, apparently benevolent entities, or he can come in the form of uh, very, very pernicious or angry or spiteful entities. They're, the, they're their direct enemies, and they always work on the basis of deception because if they were to reveal exactly who they were, we wouldn't want to have anything to do with them. Then the indirect are the people of the world who are caught up in a worldly agenda, and they are channels uh, of the enemy, some, most often unwittingly, to discourage. They are amongst the men who stand before the valiant man who would break into the castle and therefore enter into life. Now, having come to that, I wonder if Charmaine's found that poem. It has, yes. Well, do you want to sing it for um, us, please, Charmaine? I'd sing it. I, I would, but my voice is a bit croaky at the moment. And okay. I'm sure people like Muriel know it well, but I'll, I'll just read it as a poem to spare your ears. Who would true valour see? Let him come hither. One here will constant be, come wind, come weather. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves confound. His strength the more is. No lion can him fright. He'll with a giant fight, but he will have a right to be a pilgrim. Hobgoblin nor foul fiend can daunt his spirit. He knows he at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies fly away. He'll fear not what men say. He'll labour night and day to be a pilgrim. Praise the Lord. So that's really reminiscent. Thanks for that, Charmaine. I would have liked to, uh, someone to attempt to sing it. Who would well, you can probably find it if you Google, Google it. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Yeah. Who sure would Charles true valor see? That's it. So that that that's there to encourage us that we are to be mighty men and women of God. And in the humiliation through the valley of death, that is in uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Christian meets Apollyon, who is actually mentioned by name, that's another name for the devil, or one of his foul fiends, uh, who is mentioned actually in the book of Revelation. And uh, Apollyon says this, where have you come from and where are you going? The Christian says, I have come from the city of destruction 
which is a place of all evil, I'm going to the city of Mount Zion. Napoleon says, by this I perceive that you are one of my subjects, for all that country is mine, and I am the prince and god of it. How is it that, then that you have run away from your king? Were it not that I hope you may do me more service, or I'd strike you now with one blow to the ground. Christian says, I was born indeed in your dominions, but your service was hard, and your wages such as a man could not live on, for the wages of sin is death. Therefore, when I was come to years, I did, as other considerate persons do, look out if perhaps I might mend myself. Napoleon says, There is no prince that will thus lightly lose his subjects, neither will I as yet lose thee. But since you complain of your service and wages, be content to go back, and what our country will afford, I do here promise to give you. Christian says, But I have let myself to another, even to the king of princes, and how can I with fairness go back with you? And Napoleon says, you have done this, according to the proverb, changed a bad thing for the worse, but it is ordinary for those that have professed themselves to be his servants, after a while, to give him the slip and return again to me. Do thou so too, and all shall be well. See the temptation of the evil one coming through. A Christian says, I've given him my faith and sworn my allegiance to him. How then can I go back from this and not be hanged as a traitor? Napoleon says, you did the same to me, and yet I'm willing to have you back if you will now turn again and go back with me. And so it so goes on this curious conversation between the devil. And uh, I, I just commend that you to read it, not for your amusement, but for your edification, because uh, a great fight ensues and blow is put upon blow, but with the sword, the sword is able to deal completely and totally neutralize the effects of Napoleon. So the people of the world, the evil spirits, Satan himself, um, and, of course, the real enemy is our flesh or our self-life. In the book of John, uh, it, it says in, Rome, in, in John chapter 12, if a man loves his life, he'll lose it. But if he hates his life, he gains the life of the ages, he gains eternal life. Now, the life that's referred to that is, of course, the life of the flesh, the life that's given over to selfish pursuits. So we are called to put the flesh to death, to take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and and uh, very, very important, and Pam Blunt and Charmaine and all those that are really dedicated prayer warriors and intercessors would know this, that it says in the book of Job, Job chapter 22, verse 28, and let me refer you to it, Job chapter 22, verse 28, that we have great power that's been imparted to us by God through the Holy Spirit so that we, we have an authority to exercise over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it actually says this in Job chapter 22 and verse 28, it says this, uh, For thou shalt make your prayer to the Lord, and he shall hear you, and you shall pay your vows. Also, you shall decree a thing or declare a thing, and it shall be established upon you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. When men are cast down, then you shall say, Be lifted up, and you shall save the humble person. You shall deliver uh, the innocent. He'll be delivered through the pureness of your hands, walking in the cleansed life, the life cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So that's the qualification for Job 22, 28 and following to be effective. Thou shalt decree a thing. And one of the things I'd noticed, and this is, this is quite commonplace, people will be praying for something and in the next sentence, they'll counter it by saying something negative about it. So never confess negatively about your faith vision. Just a quick story. Mary Louise and I had one of our, our children uh, was having difficulties in uh, his personal, so in, in, in his marriage, and it looked like uh, you know, a separation had taken place. I won't go into details. And it was, 
for a period of five or six years, Ari Louise and I held on to the to the uh, the hem of the Lord's garment for healing to that relationship, and would not suffer anyone to even suggest that divorce would take place. And we 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 just held on in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. And I remember when in July 2018 in Queensland, Mary Louise told me that she'd heard uh, just that very day from our son who said that that their relationship was mended. And I just remember saying, praise the Lord, just praise the Lord. But up to that time, relatives were saying, because one of my sister's households has just been a, a rash of divorces, okay, and people sort of expect it these days. You never confess negatively in the face of your faith vision. And uh, walking in the spirit that we may not fulfill the lusts of the sinful nature is another key to the action of the overcomer. Uh, I also say very, very important to watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Yeah, I think the Bible says something about put a guard over my lips, O Lord. Um, <clears throat> that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. In Ephesians 4.29, Ephesians 4.29, I'm just looking at, give the, the actual quote. 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It's amazing how there are people spend a lot of time criticizing other ministries. Or amazing how they'll let a word like, dare I say it, on this hello group, it starts with B and ends in Y, and it's a common Australian swear word, but they think nothing of using that word. It actually means by Our Lady originally in the old um, 16th century uh, vernacular. Or people will say things like struth or, oh my gosh, watch the words of your mouth because we are given to have a creative announcement coming out of this. Let sweet waters emerge, not bitter waters from our mouth. And when people comment on other ministers or ministering, they don't realise they're poisoning people concerning the body of Christ. Now, they might have seen something in YouTube which was critical of this ministry, and they form a whole construct and allow the flesh to... See, the Lord, the Lord doesn't invite us to be critics. He invites us to be prayerful, and he invites us to be edifying, but never to be critics. You know, some people say, oh, well, man, the man who has the Holy Spirit judges all things, and no man judges him. That judgment is not a judgment to condemn others. It's a judgment of discernment. It's quite different from the judgment unto condemnation that Jesus refers to in Matthew's gospel, where he says, judge not uh, otherwise you yourself would be judged, because that's a judgment under condemnation. If you uh, remove these things from your life, and I'm not saying that any of you have those things, you will do extremely well, and you'll see the grace of God abound. Another thing that the, of the overcomer in action is loving not the world. Now, Mary Louise and I have found that we used to like, you know, certain programs on TV. They were pretty seemingly innocent, but we found that we couldn't watch them after a while. Now, this is not an advertisement, but it seems the only things we can certainly watch are worship services or, or <laughs> these days, whereas a few years ago, we might have been able to watch Doc Martin or <laughs> someone like that, but we can't even handle Doc Martin anymore. And... Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a funny show in many respects, but they're, they're making fun of people who are absolutely losers all the time. Uh, so the scripture, when the scripture says, love not the world, not of the things are in the world, for anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, means eschew, put it away from you. It, it won't do you any good. And the, the seventh point is, do not feed the flesh. Now, we're not just talking about food here, we're talking about anything that the flesh lusts after, the lust the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Don't in any way feed it. Let it starve to death if it has to. So how do we activate as we come to conclude our little discussion tonight? 
uh, how do we activate the overcoming life in our own life? First of all, be constantly listening for the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I was with some people on the weekend and there was a dear brother uh, who told me how, um, I think he's online with us tonight, how he had heard the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit telling him how to handle the recent emergencies that came our way uh, with the, the COVID pandemic, for example. Listen to the still, small voice. Don't just listen to what the world's saying. It's a, usually a crock of lies. Uh, then confirm the direction through godly counsel and um, and also seeking the Lord personally and weighing that up with what the Scripture clearly says. Remember the Scripture which says, you, have, you are of God, little children, and, and you have an unction which is from the Father that no man needs to teach you because this unction, that is this, this anointing, is, is what teaches you. And remember the, the New Testament saints, they'd make a decision based on what was good according to their own insights, but of course it had to be backed up by the Holy Spirit's uh, affirmation. Now, separate yourselves from those who are unrepentant. I'm talking about Christians who are unrepentant or are living in compromise. Now, that doesn't mean to say we can't, we're, we're being unkind to them or treating them like some sort of vermin. But remember, evil conversation corrupts good manners. And uh, that's that's old King James Version. It just means that evil behavior will corrupt you if you hang around it for too long. And unrepentant people are people who once named the name of Christ, but just drifted off and uh, don't regard it any longer. And here's another important one. Pray and fast. As we pray and fast, let there be no negative confession about what you are praying about. Pray and fast. And finally, and above all, remember the words of the Song of Solomon, My beloved is mine, and I am his, and his banner over me is love. That's our, our love for him and his, his hand upon us, which is our sustaining Power is a friend of mine unjustly put in jail for four years, trumped up charges by the Australian tax office, not justified. They rewrote the laws and grandfathered them back to his day and accused him of breaking a law that hadn't existed and uh, and changed the jury, got a whole lot of people with interesting hairdos into the, into the jury that just went um, the way that the judge wanted to put him away after having been exonerated by the previous jury. And he spent four years in jail. He's been a major contributor to Australia for Jesus. And uh, let me say this. He never missed a beat, but led many people to the Lord in jail and was steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And what, what a glorious testimony that he has brought. Truly a wonderful example of an overcomer. Well, brothers and sisters, our time has gone on that subject. Uh, let's just pray uh, on that on that point, and then we'll finish off with a couple of announcements. So, if if uh, if you just join me in prayer as we look at uh, summarising, well, we have summarised what it is to be an overcomer. Of course, this will be available online later on, and there are quite a few chat notices along the way where people have posted things that would be quite useful for us to look at. But I'm just going to ask Roger to close in prayer and commit us to the Lord's service that we would be that overcomer, each one of us, that in general we would all be overcomers. Very much, Roger. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for for this uh, for this time tonight, for this message about being overcomers and how to live the overcoming life in, in you, empowered by you and um, for you, Lord. Um, may may the words that be spoken find find good ground in us may we may we take heed of what you've been speaking to us and not just be hearers but put it into action lord in our lives to truly be overcomers finishing the race as an overcomer lord right to the end lord we pray that tonight lord we we will step into that without fear without um undaunted knowing that you you are the one who makes us able to be victorious 
and an overcomer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for, the, for listening in. We'll be finishing up shortly, but uh, comment about the shop, Andrew, whilst uh, we've got you online there. Uh, yes, thanks, Tony. Um, orders are going ahead well. Um, uh, there was some that went out last week. Uh, there's two or three orders uh, pending uh, this week. Um, the, the picture um, on the screen there, um, that, that's the uh, the T-shirt showing the, the logo with the way of life and the, the tree and um, the way uh, symbol. Uh, so that's our, that's uh, uh, showing our new T-shirt available both in green and grey, um, as well as the, uh, the cap there, uh, prominent the way of life. Uh, so f feel free to uh, put your orders into to me at um, afjshop.com. Um, so, uh, and uh, the Lord uses people, uh, but he also uses uh, resources, uh, you know, particularly when they're given out in a way where you um, engage with the people and they have a sense of uh, you as a person and they've got some follow-on material to uh, look at afterwards. And some of that is um, uh, the, the cards, um, as well as uh, Jesus is the way of life, the Gospel of John booklet. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thank you for all the work you're doing and for Bronwyn's support too, because we know that that's so important in the whole process. And it's been a tremendous help uh, as we sought to grow the ministry further to know that you're on the job there, Andrew, and thank you for that. As you know, online, every one of our Zoom meetings is posted by YouTube, and Charles does that. We've got some things coming up, Prayer for Souls on the 23rd of September. Uh, Arun, are you still there with us, brother? Are you still there? Uh, yeah, Tony, yep. Now, you're going to do some uh, big deal that you're planning shortly. Do you want to talk about that quickly? Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, so I I uh, had a vision just uh, three weeks before for uh, a campaign uh, for one gospel and uh, uh, 10 days and uh, 100 harvest and then 1,000 seeds planted. And uh, so uh, I just uh, share this uh, uh, vision with our local groups as well, very big AFJ group. And everyone is delighted, everyone is welcomed. And then we are planning to do the uh, continuous campaign like from January 1st to January 10th for the continuous 10 days, except the Sunday. So ultimately it is like uh, from 1st to 11th of Jan 2025. Very good. Well, I'm yet to digest your plan completely, but it sounds very, very exciting, Ron, and we'll be praying for you in that and uh, encouraging any way we can. Yeah. Uh, also, just for people in Melbourne, we're planning a, a gospel dinner in late October, and I'm possibly going to run that at a church in Coburg. I've talked to one of the elders from the Baptist Church in Coburg, and that we will have a dinner there, and, and because that's a very good central point for all of our teams. Um uh, and uh, Roger, the Jacaranda Festival coming up in uh, late October, early November. Yes, we, we're planning to uh, to send a team to and and raise up a team also from uh, local Grafton people and local Northern Rivers area for the Jacaranda Festival. So um, we we sort of checked it out last year, and it was definitely um, a productive ground and um, for the gospel. So that's coming up as well excellent thank you and uh, greg are you there can you just give us a quick th thought about your thoughts about the tamworth country music festival in 2025 yeah thanks honey uh, and again we have um, pastor james and carrie idle from uh, liberty church uh, providing their facilities again so uh, no, we're looking for uh, more team members to join us this year and make it even more successful than it has been. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're aiming for at least 20 people to be there from all over as well as locally and uh, supporting the teams and the growing teams that Greg is the regional coordinator now of the New England area. Uh, we'd, we'd just love to get as many people there as possible, even if it's just for a few days at a time that some people can make it. So that's really exciting what we've been through. Uh, it's now for time for us to wrap up, but we'd like to wrap up uh, with a prayer. And I see Jenny White there, who's always coming on WhatsApp, is very diligent in her role as regional coordinator in parts of South Australia. 
it's very exciting to see things that are happening over in South Australia. I'm sure Peter Whiten agrees with me on that and are very pleased to see just the way the the leadership that Jenny has been providing. I wouldn't mind if asking Jenny could close in prayer for us this evening. Would you be happy to do that, please, Jenny? Oh, Tony. Yes, thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we do praise and worship and adore you. We thank you, Father, that we can meet together in this way on Zoom and pray and worship you and be encouraged. We thank you for the message tonight. We thank you, Father God, that you are always spurring us on in the things of you higher and higher into the greater things of you help us to be faithful help us to be um, reliable father god in our lives for you and as evangelists i commit each one to you father i pray your blessing over each one thank you for your hand upon afj for our leaders and for all that you're doing Thank you for every heart that hears the message of salvation, for every soul that receives you. And we give you all the praise, honour and glory in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And uh, no doubt some of you have been able to reserve some of the chat lines. Someone put in a bit of a summary about Ridley and Latimer uh, during the reign of Edward, just after Edward VI. Um Sam Dermott put in some useful comments. Charles also talked about Joe Herb in battle. Um, uh, there was someone even posted, I think, the song Who Would True Valor See? So, I mean, people have been active behind the scenes there. I don't know if you can pick them up on your recording, but uh, they're there. So thanks, everyone, for your highly contributive evening. It's great to see everybody. We're on the move. We're on the move and uh, seeing God hand move. It's just great to see Steve Ladd there with a lovely tree that's reminiscent of the tree of life behind him. And um, uh, so we'd, we'd be grateful if you could stay a little bit for the after chat presided over by Roger. It's the way of life, Tony, actually. What's that? Way of life, not tree of life. The way of life. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, Steve. Uh, thanks for correcting me on that. So uh, do stay behind for a bit of an informal chat and it'd be just great to see everyone if you can manage that. So over to you, Roger, if you want to stop the recording and we'll conclude and move into our after chat.